I'm Mark Plattner. I'm the co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and director of the National Endowment for Democracy's International Forum for Democratic Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's event entitled The Elusive Synthesis, Exploring the Changing Relationship Between Democracy Support and Development Aid. It's very fitting that Carnegie Endowment and the Journal of Democracy should join to co-sponsor this meeting as it's based on an article by Carnegie's Tom Carruthers that will appear in the October issue of the Journal of Democracy. That issue should be out to subscribers and on newsstands in the next 10 days or so. Now, Tom, who recently became a member of the Journal's editorial board, has long been a prolific contributor to our pages. And his essays have often sparked wide discussion within the democracy promotion community and beyond. In fact, Johns Hopkins University Press has just published uh, our latest edited volume called Debates on Democratization, uh, and it features more contributions from Tom than from any other author. Uh, this volume, which is edited by Larry Diamond, myself, and the journal's executive editor, Phil Kostopoulos. Uh, if Phil is here, I would ask him to stand up, but I think he's probably not. Anyway, he's the real secret to uh, the success of the Journal of Democracy. He uh, manages to make things readable that uh, are hard to make readable. Um, in any case, uh, that, this volume is available for purchase in the back of the room uh, if anyone uh, would like to get it. Um, it contains debates that appeared in the journal's pages on five separate subjects, democratic consolidation, the transition paradigm, sequencing, the color revolutions, and presidentialism versus parliamentarism. And two of these five debates, the one on the transition paradigm and the one on sequencing, were triggered by essays first written by Tom. We think Tom's newest contribution to the journal will also generate a good amount of attention and perhaps even controversy. And as a result, we commissioned a couple of responses to accompany his essay in this same October issue. Uh, and conceivably, we might also publish some additional comments in the future. Uh, since Tom's essay explores the relationship between the democracy and the development communities, and the differences in their viewpoints, we naturally wanted to have a response from each camp. And we feel very fortunate to have gotten <coughs> contributions from excellent representatives from each community. Uh, from Brian Levy of the World Bank from the development side, and Ken Wallach and Scott Hoobly of the National Democratic Institute, NDI, from the democracy promotion side. Uh, Brian's comment bears the title the case for principled agnosticism. Uh, I think when you hear his presentation, you'll understand why. And Ken and Scott's contribution is entitled, Getting Convergence Right. Ken Wallach is abroad this week, but we're very pleased that his co-author, Scott Hoobly on the right, and Brian Levy on my left are both here with us today. We're hoping for a lively discussion, but we're not expecting a version of Crossfire. Uh, sometimes the debates on democratization that we uh, try to foster become heated, but more often uh, they're characterized by a variety of nuanced and in-between positions rather than a head-on clash. And my guess is that will prove to be the case today. Uh, while a synthesis of the views of the democracy and development communities may remain elusive, certainly there are some points of convergence. At the same time, however, there may well be some really fundamental differences between the views of the two communities about how countries can best make progress. And I hope those will also be illuminated by the discussion today. Your invitations contain bios of the speakers, so I'll <coughs> offer only the briefest introductions of them. Tom Carruthers, who's our principal speaker, is vice president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment, right here that is. Brian Levy is head of the Governance and Anti-Corruption Secretariat at the World Bank Group, and Scott Hubley is Director of Governance Programs at NDI. Tom will lead off, speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then Brian and Scott, in that order, will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes. And that should leave us a decent amount of time 
uh, for the audience to participate in questions and answers. So, Tom. Thanks very much, Mark. I'd first like to thank the Journal of Democracy, first and foremost, for being there. Uh, when you write something like this, there's really almost nowhere else to turn that you know will take a sympathetic interest in such an article and will be such a good platform for publicizing. So I really thank the journal, not just Mark, but his whole team, Phil and Brent Calmer and Tracy Brown and others there. Uh, who do so much to make the journal what it is. And I'd also like to thank the UK Department for International Development, which has been supporting my research over the last couple of years and has helped stimulate my own interest in this question of the intersection of the development communities and the developed community and the democracy community. This article began, <clears throat> like a lot of things that I write, uh, on a restless night in a hotel room on a trip when I was jet lagged and probably peevish about one thing or another relating to my trip. Uh, in this case, it was Kazakhstan in 1994. And those of you who've heard me mention this, I ask you to ask your indulgence. I was there for NDI on a trip to work on parliamentary strengthening with the Kazakh parliament. <clears throat> and that night at dinner, I had been sitting in a restaurant together with a couple of other NDI folks. And at a table next to us was a group of consultants hired by the World Bank to work on privatization in Kazakhstan and banking reform also. And we got to talking. And as I talked to them, I was startled by two things. One was that a lot of what we were doing, working on parliamentary reform, was likely to have a significant effect on, over the long term at least, on privatization and banking reform in Kazakhstan. And what they were doing on privatization was going to have significant effect on the political life of Kazakhstan in terms of the balance of power. Yet, we were completely separate from each other. We didn't know why we were, we didn't know we were both in the country at the same time. We didn't know each other. And as we talked, we didn't have a very common language. They weren't very sympathetic to what we were doing. And we were just sort of blank about what they were doing to some extent. And I was really struck by the gulf between these two sort of communities that I saw there vividly in that, in that form. And since then, I have watched the two communities fairly closely over the years and watched this question of the relationship between them because I think it's a key element to the overall development and democracy enterprise. And I think what we've seen over the last 20 years is a gradual process that may be convergence, it may be integration, but I think we're really not sure. And what I'd like to do here today and what I've done in my article is to outline in very general terms, sometimes at the expense of you know, specific getting certain things right, but in general terms, what has been this process of evolution or convergence, if you will? Why has it occurred? And where has it led us? Where are we now? And this isn't just a story about organization and sociology of communities. This is something deeper. Because starting in the late 1980s, and then in the early 1990s, the Western community, if you will, there is such a thing, started holding out to the world the idea of a unified or integrated model or dream that economic development and political development go hand in hand, as was often said by top level policymakers in those years. And I think it's taken the assistance community almost 20 years to be catching up with that idea and to really implement that in practice. Um, but as it's done so, we've reached the point here 20 years down the road where we also have to ask whether that post-Cold War ideal is really still valid and whether top-level policymakers who still say that really believe it and whether others are really listening. So I think this issue actually touches it, some fundamental questions. Now, the early period, <clears throat> the 1980s and early 1990s, I think is uh, important to remember how separate the communities were initially. Of course, the separation was partly organizational and that the democracy assistance community was specifically formed outside of the development community, it was put into political foundations, organizations that were really created specifically for democracy work. And the kind of people who were attracted to this community were different from developmentalists. They were lawyers, political consultants, sometimes former lobbyists, um, people who had direct political experience. They were not the traditional sort of developmental crowd. But it wasn't just organizational and personal. There was a difference in outlook between the two communities that was quite fundamental. And that the democracy community, in my <clears throat> memory, in my experience at the time, was quite, in some cases, ignorant of, or in other cases, wary of the development assistance community. It was wary of what they saw as a prevailing idea behind closed doors in the development community among developmentalists that many countries in the world were, quote, not ready for democracy, something that really got democracy promoters back up at that time. 
And they were also not comfortable with the operational habits of the development community. They felt it was too static, too bureaucratic, too oriented towards sort of long-term studies and reports and evaluations, and also too focused on governments. Um, this was a community, the democracy community, that tended in those, especially in those heady years of the late 80s and early 1990s, to think of, quote, government as more the problem than the solution. Uh, and they saw the development community as deeply aligned with, with governments, which made them uncomfortable. In turn, developmentalists had their own doubts about this sort of upstart community of assistance providers who were working on democracy. First and foremost, I think developmentalists had a profound aversion to, quote, being political, because really for two fundamental reasons. First, they felt it would complicate their lives. The, the relationships that they had with the governments that they were assisting would be threatened if they were to go in with a, quote, political agenda. And secondly, they weren't convinced that democracy was good for development. And in fact, they were quite skeptical of that idea and still holding on to the idea of the strong hand model of development, which had been quite prevalent in the 1970s and 1980s. And they were also a bit skeptical of the operational habits of the democracy community. They thought, what about some studies? What about some evaluations? What about a little less spontaneity and a little more planning? So there was a real difference between the two communities. That's changed. <clears throat> that change has taken place with, in, in my view, each side moving a bit towards the other. But the question is, are they meeting in the middle? Let me describe that process of evolution on each side. In both cases, it started in the 1990s but then accelerated in this decade for reasons I'll talk about. On the democracy side, processes of change in the democracy community started in the 90s when the organizational forms of the community changed because aid agencies began to get into democracy work, creating offices for democracy and governance within them, and democracy aid got to be funded more and more by assistance agencies, and as a result, had to align itself and to conform to some extent with the methods of the aid agencies and learn to be more projectized, more systematic, more planning, and so forth. I mean, I have a vivid memory in 1986 when I was working in the first office at USAID of democracy development. I was walking down the hallway one day, and we were really just literally throwing things together in that office. We were not following USAID's procedures and practices. We, we were just scrambling to, to spend money. And, and, and I was walking down the hallway, and this man walked past who was one of what were called at USAID at the time, the green eye shade guys, um, who were sort of mythical figures in USAID. And they were scary figures. Um, and he looked at me, and I was on assignment from the State Department, so he knew I was disloyal and not a real USAID person. And, and he said to me, we're going to get you. Um, you're not going to keep getting to do what you're doing, having all that fun in that office, throwing money around the world without plans, log frames, evaluations, and so forth. And, and he was right. Um, uh, <laughs> So in the 1990s, democracy aid, not just in the US, but also in Europe, began to face uh, the reality of working more systematically and having to work with different kinds of money. In addition, and probably just as importantly on the substance side, democracy aid began to change in the 90s because the early period of focusing on elections and political parties and catalytic political change began to be transformed as governments came into place in newly democratizing countries, and then they had to govern. And the democracy community was now sort of stuck with the task of, well, we've helped these great people get into power. Now what do we do? And the democracy community had to start working on state institutions and take seriously the question of state reform. So they began working to strengthen legislatures, to strengthen uh, judicial systems, to build local governments, and so forth. And so the democracy community itself began engaging in governance practices still with the political focus. Yet these institutions inevitably you know, work on socioeconomic issues. And so the democracy community began finding that if they're working with courts, there may be commercial courts that are dealing with commercial issues or local governments working on local development projects and so forth. So the democracy community began approaching this side as well. And the same was true with its civil society work. The heroic period of civil society simply as resistance also transformed as civil societies had to begin to learn to be partners with the state reform processes and so forth. And the democracy community couldn't just support kind of heroic dissidents. They had to also support civil society actors who were engaged in trying to change day-to-day -day life in their countries in socioeconomic terms. This was all very tentative in the 1990s on the democracy side. In this decade, it began to gain some momentum for really one fundamental reason, which is that in this decade, as we know what's happened in this decade, democracy has slowed down or stopped, or in some people's view, started moving backward in the world. And of course, that's due to various factors. But one of the factors that weighs on people's mind in the democracy assistance community 
is the idea that democracies are not delivering uh, sufficiently for their people. People get frustrated with democracy and that corrodes weak democracies. And so this idea that the democracy community has sort of quote, woken up uh, to the, the challenge of helping democracies deliver has been a powerful impetus in recent years to get the democracy assistance community thinking differently and in some cases acting differently. So in the article I mentioned a few specific elements of this. You see it partly at NDI, for example, with some, you know, a whole initiative called Helping Democracy Deliver and programs that focus on political parties or legislatures and so forth that try to integrate socioeconomic elements. Uh, you also see it in uh, Swedish SIDA, uh, which in this decade has really clearly come down on the idea that um, democracy is integral to development and that all of its development programs through its rights-based approach should have a clear political and civil rights element. And so in Kenya, for example, CEDA did a re-engineering of CEDA's program in Kenya in which they went through all 12 of their socioeconomic program areas and tried to build political and civil rights into each one and to say that we need to integrate fully the political and civil side, civil rights side to the development side. You also see at USAID, thinking about this subject, um, the Guinea mission, which I mentioned in the article in 2006 of USAID, has tried to create an integrated democracy and governance program in which the health, agriculture, and education programs were integrated into a democracy and governance strategic objective and to say that it all flows from democracy and governance. And there's a great deal of talk, I'd say, currently at USAID about how to take such integration forward. So you have some significant impetus on the democracy side. What about on the development side? There, uh, the picture is, is parallel, but it's different. What you have in the 1990s is in the, in the development community, again, we're speaking very generally here, is it was a community that initially in the 80s and early 90s with the market reform agenda was really quite focused on shrinking states. But as you remember, there was this kind of realization or epiphany transformational thinking that occurred in the mid-1990s in the development community, which was, wait a minute, if we want these states to carry out effective development policies, yes, they should be smaller in certain ways, but they have to be more effective, they have to be more competent, that we need effective states in order to carry out the market reform agenda. And there was this rediscovery of the state, as it was called. I have a book, 1995, published by the Inter-American Development Bank called The Rediscovery of the State in Latin America. And if you had to ask who lost the state, well, it was the development community that had lost focus on the state, and it was rediscovering it. And so there was this sudden embrace of the idea of institution building. That was what it was normally called. And those days are then began to, began to be called governance. And at the same time, uh, the World Bank in those years, as you remember, under Wolfensohn, began to take seriously the problem of corruption, both corruption in developing countries, but also corruption within the World Bank and development aid agencies themselves. And corruption led you to a focus as well on governance and the state and so forth. Now, initially, in the second half of the 1990s, this focus on governance was quite technocratic rather than political in the following senses, that they tended to work on a very small range of institutions, especially public sector finance institutions, budgetary institutions, central banks, and so forth. Secondly, they defined success in governance in very narrow terms as efficiency. This was the idea was to make efficient government institutions. And third, their methods were very narrow in the sense that it was just injections of technical knowledge or technical assistance into these institutions, which they hoped would do the trick. So they were really, they had opened the door to politics by knocking on this door of governance and opening it, and they looked through, but they were not yet ready to walk into a sort of a full political uh, bazaar, which was what was sort of facing them on the other side of this door. But again, as with the democracy community, in this decade, change began to accelerate for somewhat different, different reasons. Um, I think what happened in the first half of this decade was that the initial push into the governance domain by the development community bounced off a lot of these institutions. The enthusiasm about, well, we'll just take you know, civil services or judiciaries or you know, cabinet institutions and so forth and transform them through this technical assistance proved very frustrating to a lot of people and organizations as that particularly civil service reform, for example, they tried, you know, major efforts and discovered that, you know, institutions rooted in patronage and very bad incentives politically tended to be resistant to reform. And there get to be, there, there followed a widening of the governance agenda, and the widening was basically a process of politicization of the governance agenda. So first they began to widen the range of institutions that they were working with, no longer just focusing on budget offices, but really to a wide range. So you have the World Bank working with parliaments, for example, in some cases, or uh, local governments quite intensively. Secondly, very importantly, they broadened from going from efficiency 
to a much more normative set of values in talking about governance. Transparency, accountability, and responsiveness. Different combinations of different aid agencies, but these concepts much more normative in a political sense and getting very close to talking about if you have an institution which is accountable to its people, transparent, responsive to its people, isn't that probably in a, in a democratic framework of some type? Really begin to inch towards politically normative ideas about governance. To help, and then they began working with a wider range of tools. Instead of just injections of technical assistance, they began looking at the whole demand side, uh, as they called it, and demand for good governance became a big fashion in these years as the World Bank and a number of other major developmental donors began focusing on civil society assistance to energize or animate civil society groups to push for good governance. And so they began moving down uh, this, this path that was taking them towards politics. To do so, they embraced a set of analytic tools that are basically focused around political economy analysis. It, they came under different names. Uh, Diffid started using drivers for change analysis. The Swedes did something called power analysis. The Dutch used something called strategic governance and corruption analysis, just to prove that every donor could have their own framework <laughs> and their own methods, um, and their own consultants, and so forth. The World Bank has its own tools of political economy analysis. But if you put them all in a pot and boil the water, uh, they're all pretty similar to each other. And they're based on a common insight that we really need to understand both the political underpinnings of the situation in which we're working, the political incentives, forces, and structures that impinge upon and constrain development. And so <coughs> uh, many governance programs carried out under a developmental focus looked very similar to programs carried out under a democracy focus. And so if you walked into a parliamentary program in a country and said, what are you doing here to the people working on it, it might be difficult to tell, is this a democracy program working with the parliament or is this a World Bank governance program working with the parliament? But there were differences. But there started to be a great deal of overlap between the two communities. But even though the development community began to, quote, take politics into account and talk a lot about that, and the term taking politics into account is very common in, in at least the northern development agencies in northern Europe and Britain, Germany and Canada and to some extent the United States, um, I would say that they, the, this, the, the real formula privately behind closed doors is governance, yes, politics, yes, democracy, we're not sure. Um, and because, interestingly, there's still the two concerns that I talked about from the 1980s are still very much present. First, there's still a basic uncertainty in, quote, the development community, if I can generalize, is democracy really good for development or not? And we'll hear from Brian soon as the title of his piece, The Case for Principled Agnosticism, gives you a sense of where at least he's going. Uh, and I think that's um, very common in the development community to say, you know, we think we can find proof that good governance or governance along the lines of which we defined has positive developmental impacts or implications. We're much less confident if it comes to democracy. And so, yes, we're certainly interested in taking politics into account, but we're really not sure about democracy. And secondly, there's still, I'm not pointing fingers at any particular development agency, but there's still a lot of concern about relationships with governments. Uh, and that, quote, being political is sensitive. And that being, writing a really stinging political economy analysis of the entrenched, you know, tribal roots of corruption in Kyrgyzstan, it's going to upset somebody in Kyrgyzstan, somebody who might be the minister who you're working with, or so forth. And that, unfortunately, this was just the bad timing of history. The move in the development community to, quote, take politics into account in this decade happened to coincide with the Bush administration's use of democracy promotion in ways that really set the world on edge. And so at the same time, developmentalists were saying, yeah, I guess we ought to pay attention to this politics stuff. The whole notion of politics as a cross-border activity led by the West and pushed on to the third world got to be unusually sensitive again, as it had not been since the 1980s. Just bad timing, but it affected people. And so um, it was a kind of two currents that were hitting and not really meeting very comfortably. And this hesitation over democracy in the development community is, is embodied right here in this room today. When I was doing the invitation list for this event, I worked very hard to develop an equal number of people that I would invite from the World Bank, Center for Global Development, and other organizations. Basically, almost none of them is here today. This is an entirely a democracy room, at least 90 to 95 percent a democracy room. When developmentalists see an event that's called democracy and development, even though, you know, we serve good Chinese food. Uh, <laughs> it's, of course, the World Bank has a good cafeteria, but um, it's hard to get them to come. Uh, democracy people are interested. 
Development people are not sure, as I said. And so that leads us to where, where we've ended up with, because I think we've ended up at an interesting and important point, but it's a confusing one. Both sides of the community have evolved considerably towards a kind of common ground, and there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of programmatic intersection that's going on. And so you can, you can sort of say to yourself, no, no, it's all, it's all coming together. I see it. It's, it's overlapping. But I think it's not clear. We have to get our, our concept straight in our mind. Is this an integration that's occurring of the two communities? Is it a convergence? Is it an alignment? What is it exactly? I guess I think of it um, as a unequal and uneasy convergence. Uh, and by unequal, what I mean is that I think it is becoming fairly widespread in the democracy assistance community to believe that there's a natural connection between what they do and good development. And most of the democracy people, if you push them, they'll say, well, look, we're trying to make political systems more accountable and representative, and that's got to be good for development. We're just sure it is. Um, and so they really, and they say, you know, we, we'd like to partner. We'd like to show this. At the same time, there's a hesitation within the community of, we're a pretty small ice cube, and if we melt in the, the larger glass of development aid, we could get lost. And we don't want to get lost because we still do what we do for intrinsic reasons, not just instrumental reasons. So yes, we think we're instrumentally important, but we're still a community that's about intrinsic values. And so convergence, yes, but uneasy and unequal because we're kind of small and they look very big to us. On the other side, as I said, the development community looks over and says, well, we think there are some lessons here about politics and about governance uh, that are important to us, which we need to incorporate, but we're not really going to cross this line into democracy. We will come alongside you, but you do what you do, where you do, we'll do what we do. We're developmentalists. We're instrumentalists in that sense. And you have your intrinsic values, which we share at some other level, but that's not what we get up in the morning and do, which try to promote democracy in countries. And so we can't really join across that bridge and arm in arm with you. And so we're at this uneasy point where I think the next five or 10 years are very important in terms of, have we sort of arrived and this is it? Is this as good as it gets? Is it going to get, I mean, it could actually, I think, drift backward because I think the push for politics and development meets resistance still at certain parts of the development community. And fashions tend to come and go, in my experience. It's not established yet, I think, a completely firm hold. But more deeply, returning to my opening theme, you know, for 20 years, or for 20 years ago, the West held out this idea of an integrated model of political and economic development, market reform, and democracy that would go hand in hand. But as the assistance community has been catching up, it's sort of partly gotten there. But once it's there, it looks around and sees a world where that consensus is in doubt in many places. And many people are saying, what, that consensus was a nice idea of the post-Cold War and a bit of heady times. That period's over. We're dealing with alternative models of development now, authoritarian capitalism, questioning of liberal democracy, weakness on the part of democracies themselves in managing their own financial affairs. So the very moment at which we sort of feel we've caught up a bit and finally got the two communities somewhat converged, the question is, is what they're converging around still really the ethos of our time? So I think the question of what happens to this integration is part and parcel of figuring out what we think, or at least what we hope, the world is head, where the world is headed in terms of what kind of economic and political models are likely to prevail in the next generation. Thanks for your attention. Look forward to your comments. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That was almost as good as your article. So. <laughs> um, now, uh, Brian Levy is uh, one of the people from the development community who was brave enough to uh, accept the invitation not only to attend, but actually to speak. So uh, the floor is yours. And, and to write, Mark. Um, <laughs> so um, first, my thanks to the Journal of Democracy for the opportunity of reflection and writing about this, and to Tom, of course, who kick-started it all. Because it, it's been a challenge to write. It's been a hard piece to write. And it's a hard, it's a hard piece to respond to now for two reasons. The first reason is Tom's written a terrific piece. And when I read Tom's piece and I, as a review and a summary of the evolution of these two different cultures and the evolution of thinking within each of them, I agree with 90% of what's in that piece. But the 10% with which I'm uncomfortable was not trivial. And so in some sense, that provides the hook for me to write. The second piece is a hard piece to write is because, you know, in some sense, democracy is motherhood and apple pie. And so what am I being asked 
to write as the development professional in relation to this with a framing? Am, am I being asked to answer the question to be told that, well, actually, I don't believe in motherhood and apple pie? Or am I being asked a different question, which is, do you still beat your wife? And so sort of, ni ni neither, neither of these are appealing questions. But reflecting on it and getting behind this, I think there's something more profound that lies behind the uneasy convergence. And I think what's more profound is actually very fundamental for all of us as we work in this area. And that is the way that this issue has been framed historically has been in very much, I think, in binary terms. There's the right way and there's the wrong way. And well, democracy is the right way. No, the developmental state's the right way. And get sort of stuck in that competition around those. And what I've tried to do, and it's captured in the title of this piece, which is the case for principled agnosticism. I've tried to suggest, and I will try to suggest in my comments now, that actually we can get past that binary way of thinking about this in terms of the right way and the wrong way. There's another way of thinking about the development process and its interaction with democracy that is altogether more interesting in, it, in its implications and takes us beyond this seeming tension. But I'm going to try to do this in a way that isn't just what I'll call the lazy agnosticism of, well, it depends, but I'm putting the word principle there intentionally because I'm going to try to give a certain amount of structure to this. And I'm going to do this in the context of four points. The first two are basically about the short and the medium term, and the last two are about the longer term. So let me plunge in on the four points that I want to make. So. I think an interesting way to begin is that, you know, I think all of us, by virtue of our intellectual training, by virtue of the history of the disciplines, we all tend to approach this in such a way that we're operating as if the democracy domain and the development domain are conceptually and analytically different domains. But when we think about it, that's actually absurd. I mean, if I just take two examples that capture the profound interdependence of these domains that will be familiar to everybody in this room. I mean, the first one is I think all of us know that a strong middle class is a buttress of democracy. Adam Jaworski's result that you see no democratic reversals at income per capita is of, I believe when he published it, was $6,000 with inflation, that number would be up. It's just telling us there's something about the interaction between development and democracy right there. Or to take another one, the rule of law, I think, that we all recognize is fundamental to both democracy and to development. It's the basis for a sophisticated market economy. It's also the basis for restraining arbitrary state action. So the fact that we tend to think about democracy and development as separate domains is it's an artifact of our longstanding propensity to stovepipe, to stovepipe intellectually and to stovepipe in the way in which we take on these problems. I mean, we, just as my two examples have captured, we're obviously looking at a complex interdependent system. There are interactions, and there's a piece that I have done with Frank Fukuyama, which teases out the empirical literature across many of those. There are obvious interactions between economics, economic development, political institutions, including democracy, the structure of the private sector and the structure of civil society, and the structure of institutions in the society more broadly. Our interest whether it's as development professionals or whether it's as people working in democracy, our interest is in how that system changes. How does it move from what is a rather simple initial starting point of low incomes, personalized rules, and relatively undifferentiated private sectors and civil societies towards a place of high incomes, complex society and private sector, and a more sophisticated set of political institutions? So what we're actually asking, and this is in a sense my critical first point, we're asking how does an interdependent system change in the direction of greater complexity? And I think we know and we learn from the evolution of complex systems in general that they are not engineered on a one-time basis. Complex systems change incrementally through exploring and through cumulative processes. What we're looking at when we're asking about the interaction of development and democracy and the private sector and civil society and political institutions, we're asking, this is the first key point, about what is the dynamics of a process which, in the broad sense of the word, is fundamentally an evolutionary process. So that's the first point that I want to make. Second broad point, 
when one starts reading and thinking about evolution, and I'm very much an amateur in reading and thinking about biological evolution, but when one reads about evolution, one reads about complex systems, one quickly discovers that, though in the long run, there's some interesting convergence, and I'll come back to this. In the medium run, and, uh, and the metaphor that I think will work for many of us, the analogy is just think about the Galapagos Islands. In the medium run, what we're seeing is the route from here to there can be an extraordinarily circuitous one with a, a diversity of weird and wonderful forms that take shape in that system en route. There isn't one path of moving from simplicity to complexity in the move change in evolutionary systems. There are multiple paths. And I would suggest that the same thing is true when we talk about the development process, when we're talking about the evolution of that, this particular complex system, economics, politics, institutions, structure of society. And at the risk of oversimplifying, although I, I found this oversimplification to be quite useful in thinking analytically about some of the countries in which I work, I would suggest that actually we can think about this usefully by distinguishing heuristically between two different tra trajectories, starting from a place of relatively weak institutions and low incomes, moving towards a, pla a place of complex institutions and high incomes. One trajectory is a trajectory that from the start is relatively open. You can think of India, you can think of Colombia and Latin America, you can think of Albania, in the African context, Ghana, Zambia, Mali, Senegal, England, beginning perhaps in the 11th and 12th century onwards, depending how you read that thousand years. But we have to be thinking about those examples. That's, that's one trajectory of a process of moving from simple to complex institutions in settings where both the economics and the politics are relatively open. A second trajectory, and important to note here, that the way that I'm framing this is it's not a matter of one trajectory being good and another trajectory being bad. It's a matter of two different dynamic paths, each of which evolve in their own particular way. The second trajectory is a more status trajectory. The East Asian countries, Korea, Vietnam, to China, contemporary um, settings that I might think of in Africa, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Uganda, France prior to 1789. Pick your country. So that's the second trajectory. And the question that we want to ask ourselves for each of these two rather different trajectories is how do these systems change? And when we ask the question, what is the logic and the dynamics of how a system changes, I think one of the things that we learn about the changing in complex systems is you do not get from here to there by insisting that you should be there already. You know, there's a, there's a lot of work that says, well, you would, you would solve the problem of development if only you had strong institutions. You would also solve the problem of development if only you had high income. But that's not saying anything interesting. It's simply saying that what we're talking about is a dynamic process of getting from here to there. And one of the consistent themes in the development literature, from Albert Hirschman and his work dating back into the 1950s and 60s and onwards <laughs> to more recently, but on a sustained basis, Douglas North, is the notion of thinking of these processes of, as processes of cumulative causation. That small changes in one or two parts of this interdependent system have knock-on cumulative effects. And this is the second point. When we're thinking about the dynamics of change across these two heuristic trajectories, what we, what we are, if we are reformers, we're incrementalists looking for nonlinearities. We're looking for ways of working with the grain of things as they are in order to elicit and sustain cumulative change. And that's actually the title of my piece on principal diagnosticism. Let me just quote a piece of why, why the link here. The, the corollary of adopting an evolutionary pro, um, approach to development is a principled rather than a merely technical agnostic, rather than merely tactical agnosticism about what to do next. And I, you'll see in the next phrase, I would call myself an, it's an agnostic over a 10-year horizon, not over an indefinite horizon. The aim is to nudge the system so that 10 years on, say, it performs better in at least some, but not necessarily all domains, with the opportunity set for the subsequent 10 years more attractive than it was at the outset. In some settings, at some times, 
Democratization and the strengthening of institutions that support democracy will be high priorities. In other settings, at other times, if the goal is to nudge this cumulative interdependent system along, they will not. So that's the second point to make. Multiple trajectories with divergent implications in terms of what you do next, depending on the situation as it is in a particular setting. Brings me to my third and fourth points. Um, and the third and fourth points are talking more about the moving from the medium run to the long run. So the third point. The third point is that I think that to it sets up where I want to go. I want, it's important and it's been a central theme in the development community to unbundle what we mean by, I'm going to use the word governance here. And I think for us, we found a useful distinction between what I'm going to call small G governance and big G governance. By small G governance, we're talking about focused efforts to foster participation in an oversight of the provision of public services by stakeholders who have strong and unambiguous incentives to get results. This is more transparency, more participation, more independent monitoring. Examples include parental participation in schools, community oversight of local health clinics, um, or of road maintenance projects, oversight of public procurement. All of these small g governance initiatives are initiatives which have with tremendous rapidity been mainstreamed in the development community. And I would argue, and I'll come back to this, I would argue that while all of these offer short-term benefits, and they're workable for different reasons, whether you're in a state, um, state trajectory or whether you're in the more competitive trajectory, I would argue that all of these offer a long-run opportunity because by be reframing the relationship between public institutions and people, you're, turning, you're, you're in a long-run process reshaping a relationship from subject to citizen. So that's one, one feature. Second element of, on governance that I think we talk about, I spoke about big G governance. By big G governance, let me just again read to you what I, refers to the strengthening of national level institutions that hold government to account. These can include elected legislatures, the judiciary, centralized, um, centralized auditing authorities, ombudsmen, free and vigorous media, and the like. One prior point to make, the development community has been working for decades with me mixed success on strengthening public management institutions, if you like, the supply side of big G governance. What I'm speaking about here are more the accountability demand side of um, big G governance. And we have for the last decade, as Thomas flagged, been focusing on these. But a question that's arising, because frankly the results in our big G governance reforms are no better and in some ways worse than the results in our public management reforms. The question that leads us to ask is, under what conditions are entry points in big G governance effective? And that leads me to pose the following question to all of us. If you take a country like Korea, which is today an exemplar of democracy and an exemplar in many ways of the emergence of the rule of law and independent judiciary. And you ask, how did Korea get that way? And you ask the question, did it get that way despite the 1961 to 1987 um, period in which it was author authoritarian, or did that period, remember I'm not saying that this is the route countries should go, I'm saying it's one of two routes. Did that period build the complex private sector and the middle class which provided the platform for moving forward? I think where this leads us is to ask a difficult set of questions of what are the conditions under which our big G governance reforms can actually take hold. So from the development community point of view, Small G governance, transparency, participation, huge opportunities across almost all settings. Big G governance, under what conditions do these to actually take hold effectively? Thinking as I've described is an open-ended question. Leads me to my final point. And my, final, my fourth and final point is about the long run. And actually in thinking about the long run, and I was surprised by this as I read the evolutionary <laughs> literature, because the evolutionary literature says something that's actually very optimistic to us about the long run. First, what it says about the long run is, let's not be teleological about this. Processes of change are a knife edge. You know, there's a, Tom wrote a piece, um, is it a decade ago or so, Tom, on your, the, the end of the transition paradigm, in which, you know, Tom wrote in that piece that, you know, unfortunately what, see, what seems to happen is that the 
surge towards democracy and the enthusiasm resulted in the end, and let me see if I can find your framing of it here, Tom, um, that either dominant power politics in which there are elections but no turnovers of power or feckless pluralism in which there are frequent turnovers of power but democracy is weakly rooted in troubles. And the interesting question that, well, what we know from an evolutionary process is maybe when you're trying to go from here to there, one of those two characteristics, a seeming excess of order, dominant power politics, or a seeming excess of chaos is in the nature of what that process is like en route, not, as perhaps was the tone a decade ago, a problem that in the short run needs to be fixed. And if the process can be sustained, and it's really, there's some really interesting parallels that you find in the evolutionary literature, then in the long run, working with the grain in the logic of each of these different paths, it appears that there indeed is likely to be convergence. The convergence that we see, it's the convergence which suggests that the United States and Sweden have converged, so it's clearly not a convergence in a specific way. The convergence towards, with high, high incomes, strong private sectors, open societies, complex institutions, rather than closed economic and political institutions, that that is a long-run convergence, which is the fourth and final point. However, it's a long-run convergence that can be met as a principled agnostic through multiple divergent paths rather than insisting that the way to move forward is to get to the end today. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Brian. And now we'll move to uh, Scott. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I know uh, my co-author and NDI's president would have loved to have been here as well, and I'll do my best to kind of represent him as well in the discussion. Um, sitting on this panel, I think uh, there's probably 90% of what was said also in, in Brian's remarks that I would agree with as well. I think there is uh, a lot of convergence or to, there's, a, I think Tom hit on an important issue which, which needs to be explored because I think there is, there is more, uh, there is a lot to this discussion. In, in what I'd like to do in this time in, in kind of running through the article is to touch on uh, a few points. Again, I think we agree with maybe 90% of what Tom says. I think oftentimes we view this not so much in terms of convergence, but a pathway towards greater mutual complementarity or mutual reinforcement. I think, as Tom points out in going through the history, um, you know, we do have uh, different comparative advantages, the two communities. We have different organizational setups, different organizational, organizational cultures. And um, I think that's important and is an aspect of our respective comparative advantages. And I think as this discussion moves forward, I think there's a um, uh, cause to kind of celebrate those respective comparative advantages and discuss how they can be more mutually reinforcing rather than diluting some of those differences through kind of setting up integration or synthesis or convergence really is the end point. Um, but with that in mind, I think I'd like to just touch on some of the areas where I think going forward, these two areas, these two fields, can be more mutually reinforcing. And some of them were touched on, uh, but I'll try and develop them uh, uh, a little bit more. I think the, f the first question is kind of eliminating false choices. Um, I think, you know, as Brian alluded to, sometimes these problems are thought in very binary terms, and there is this kind of either-or dichotomy set up. And I think that that uh, is a problem. Um, I, I think there, there are a couple ways that I think the democracy community looks at this problem that kind of avoid some of these uh, false choices. I think part of it is, is how you look at the issue of development uh, as a whole. And I think the, the, the tension or this, this gap between the communities really emerges when you view development in, in purely socioeconomic terms. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people in the democracy community would tend to associate themselves more with 
Sweden's definition of policy of, of poverty, which really views kind of a lack of political voice and political inclusion as kind of the flip side of a lack of of economic options and a lack of uh, inclusion in the the formal economy. I think when you view it in that way, there's there is. Um, kind of less of a false choice to be made and also less of a focus on this question of the extent to which democratization leads to improved economic development outcomes. I think for a lot of uh, people in the democracy community, um, it's not so much, as Tom said, kind of a feeling that these things, that all good things go together and that there's a naive assumption that that these two processes um, uh, you know, automatically go together. I think that's it's clear that they they don't. But I think there is a view that both are independent. Um, you know, that it's in in U.S. policy interests and and in the global interest that to support both of these objectives simultaneously. Um, and and I think it's also what our partners ultimately want. Uh, you know, in kind of our experience around the world, you know, people are not willing to indefinitely defer one for the other. Um, people want to have a say in their government. Um, and and so I think there is a lot of this debate that often gets set up in, in, um, in falsely, uh, in, a, in a false dichotomy. I think the discussion on sequencing sometimes um, falls into that trap. The reality is um, these are very complex processes. Um, we don't have the luxury of, of um, you know, identifying ideal pathways from point A to point B. We're in the position of reacting to demands from partners, and, and partners on the ground uh, are asking for assistance in both of these areas. And so I think part of the, the step forward is to is to think of this not so much in terms of sequencing terms. I think we have to do both simultaneously. But just, again, think of this more in terms of, of how um, these endeavors can be more mutually reinforcing. I think another part of the divide that we talk about in our response is just um, the need to re retire outdated stereotypes. When people talk about the divide between these communities, oftentimes, when they describe the gap, they're referring either to um, uh, assumptions that are made that haven't been true in years, or they're attributing assumptions to one community or the other. Um, and I think the blame for that uh, lies on both sides, um, in both the, the economic development community and the political development or democratic development community. But I'd like to just touch on a, a few. Um, you know. With due respect to, to Brian's comments, um, uh, Brian's description of how uh, complex systems change and how we get from point A to point B, I don't think there's anyone on the in the democratic community that would um, disagree that um, that change uh, is highly complex. It's evolutionary. Um, there are often unintended consequences. Um, it's it's sometimes, however, portrayed as a uh, a process of of reengineering political processes from scratch. I don't think there are many practitioners or any in the democracy community that really that take that viewpoint. Although it's often ascribed to the democracy community, I think there's there is um, damage um, that. Um, has been done to the field because of the association with uh, the uh, the wars in Iraq and Af Afghanistan and and um, and some of the things that you know the democracy uh, rationale that's been retrofitted onto that. I also think it's also a question of where the democracy community gets gets the press. Um, oftentimes, people. Uh, particularly on the economic development community become you know, most aware of the work that the democracy community is doing in kind of transformational context. I think transformational elections is where NDI tends to get the most press. We get less press when we're working um, in rural Burkina Faso training women candidates. Um, I think a lot of what the democracy community does is small G as well as big G. Uh, 
uh, governance work. I think we would perhaps differ from the some in the economic development community that um, the small g governance is never enough and it doesn't automatically lead to anything more. I think if you just focus on the small g governance, um, you raise all sorts of issues in terms of you know, creating uh, civil society demand without having the political party institutions, um, the the democratic political structures to 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 take that um, work that's been done on the small g governance side and channel it into constructive, positive uh, governance outcomes at the macro level. And so, I think you need to do both. And I think you know this is something that the democracy community has been doing for years, and the question of how you get from point A to point B, I think part of it is very similar to the some of the, the analogies that Brian's uh, drawn. Um, it is, it does involve nudges, it involves support. Um, you know, we make a, a difference at the margin, supporting local actors. These processes are largely uh, endogenous, and, and what we're able to do is have an impact at the, the margin. The problem is, um, if that support isn't there, we're also sending messages. And I think that sometimes is an unintended consequence of, of kind of a lack of uh, willingness to take on some of the big G governance issues uh, as well. Um, there are a whole host of other, um, I think, stereotypes or assumptions that, that need to be uh, retired. There is this view um, still had, held by some, which I think, as Tom points out, was true, um, you know, uh, 20 years ago when this field was in its infancy. But kind of the view of kind of uh, Americans uh, exporting this model abroad, I think, is is has long since to have any validity. I think at NDI, we have over 80 nationalities speaking over 100 languages. Um, it's it's it it is often a question of facilitating sharing of experience among uh, countries that are experiencing similar developmental pathways. I think we would agree that there are multiple pathways to get from point A to point B, but we would also say that the international community has uh, a role to play in um, supporting uh, uh, groups in learning from each other. Um, you know, when, when countries have experienced other developmental pathways. Um, a few other things in terms of how we can move towards a more mutually reinfor uh, reinforcing model. I think there's been some discussion uh, uh, about, you know, increasing uh, focuses on, on political economy. Um, and I think there's a lot more that needs to be done there. I think while you know, uh, uh, Tom mentioned kind of different drivers of change analysis and CETA power analysis. I think those have been important first steps, but I think they often stop at the assessment phase um, and they're not translated into programming. Um, too often, while there's a recognition that politics matter on the economic development side, if that's interpreted in terms of I need the political support of this minister for my project, rather than politics mattering in a more macro sense of how do we nudge a system forward um, so that it has incentives that make it more likely that there will be more reform-minded ministers in a particular country. And I think that's where the democracy to, uh, community has been has been working, you know, on those questions for years. And I think um, I think we've also made some good inroads um, in how to operationalize at the programmatic level some of this work that's been done on political economy uh, analysis at the assessment level. And some of that programming is happening in partnership with the World Bank uh, and UNDP and other more traditional economic development uh, actors. Um, uh, there are some examples of this programming in the article, and so I won't go into it uh, in detail, but things like building the, the, the policy development uh, capacity of parties, for example. I mean, it's no surprise that in weak democracies that, um, that uh, you know, uh, the politics uh, or deliberative discourse is at a low level if there's no infrastructure within political parties to actually ana analyze uh, 
uh, policy and have a meaningful policy debate. If there's no infrastructure for candidate debates that create incentives for, for candidates to address policy issues, um, if there's you know, not civic ed education or work with civil society to ask the right questions. So you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done at the programmatic level in, in building uh, the, the capacity or the, the democratic infrastructure in a way that um, supports not only um, contestation through elections, but also uh, uh, supports the ability of parties and parliaments uh, to have a more elevated policy debate. I'll just conclude with, with one final uh, observation, perhaps, about an area of difference between the two communities that also, I think, is an important element of the discussion going forward on how these communities can, again, uh, work in a more mutually reinforcing manner. And that's um, this concept of, of country ownership and taking country ownership seriously. Um, because I think that's one area where you see some of these differences come to the fore. I think from the democracy community viewpoint, um, the concept of country ownership itself implies a democratization agenda. Um, who speaks on behalf of the country? Um, if you were to take that concept seriously, we have to distinguish between country ownership and ruling party ownership or ownership by a particular ministry. And I think there is a lot of, of work to be done, I think, in, in how um, the democracy community and the economic development community uh, can work together in that area. I'll lastly, conclude with one concept that's developed uh, a little bit in, in our response. And it's this concept of kind of do no democratic harm, which we float as one idea for discussion or consideration. Um, not suggesting, of course, that uh, economic development actors are out to do democratic harm. But just as the, there's an analogy, I think, with um, economic development assistance in, uh, in a conflict environment, um, unless there's a lot of safeguards put in place, a lot of, of consideration of the Democrat of of the impact of economic development assistance in a conflict environment, it can unintentionally um, have have uh, can help to fuel the conflict. I think there's a similar analogy to be made with respect to the impact of economic development assistance in a country's democratic development path. Um, uh, you know, it's it's not politically neutral no matter how it's no matter how much it's described in those terms and so as political economy analyses are developed i think there there is a need to uh ensure that um that assistance in a country for example like uh uganda um is delivered in a way that um doesn't limit a country to status pathways, for example, that, that does provide nudges along the way to, uh, to uh, address big G governance challenges as well as small G governance. Um, and so I think with, with that, uh, I'll conclude. But again, I do, I do think this is a very useful discussion. And um, when um, there's an opportunity for dialogue, I think oftentimes, uh, the, the areas of agreement tend to be more narrowed um, and, uh, and that there, are, there is a lot of benefit to, to continuing to learn from each other in this, this area. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott, and to all our presenters. It's been a, a very rich discussion, uh, both on the level of uh, practical questions of division of labor between two communities, but ranging into uh, some very uh, both broad and deep questions about the way in which societies evolve and how people from outside can, uh, can affect their evolution. So we welcome questions on all aspects of it. And uh, please just uh, introduce, state your name and your organization uh, before posing your question. Yes. Yeah, there's a microphone that can come in over here. Yeah. Just, just. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, it's Andrew Albertson from the Project on Middle East Democracy. Thank you all for your comments. This is a, a very interesting discussion so far. Um, 
I just wanted to see if you could comment on, on sort of two sort of practical uh, questions related to your, your more broad and theoretical comments. Uh, one is, you know, an ongoing discussion is on uh, development assistance reform, uh, USAID. Uh, there's a, the QDDR is coming out. There was a, the uh, Presidential Study Directive on Development uh, was discussed and I think uh, came out. And I just wanted to know um, what you think uh, your comments and your different perspectives on this mean for institutional change in, in the instruments by which the U.S. Uh, gives out development and democracy assistance. Um, and uh, secondly, you know, I really appreciated, uh, Mr. Hubley, uh, your comments the, the do no harm principle, because before that, it sounded a lot like the, the comments were all about, we're all assuming that we're talking about uh, assistance, uh, specific uh, official donors and assistance programs, and uh, sort of one of, of two components that we in our work think about, for instance. You know, on the one side, it's the positive tools that we have that can do positive things out there. And then, of course, when we're asking the question of our interlocutors in the Middle East and we're asking how can the U.S. Mm -hmm. have a more positive impact on democracy, some of the answers are not, you know, more <laughs> of this kind of assistance or more of this kind of assistance. A lot of those answers are do less of the bad things. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder um, if you have any comments on, on that side as a principled agnostic approach. Um, uh, you know, how do you rope in those sorts of concerns, the, the other policies that might stomp on um, uh, development or democracy concerns, the, uh, and the role of diplomats, you know, as they're weighing these different things. Anyways, that's a whole okay. lot, but thank you very thank much. Thank you. We will take a couple of questions. Uh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Wang Wang Yanghai. I'm a fellow of uh, National Endowment for Democracy. So my question is, uh, is, I think it's an interesting and complicated issue. Uh, my question, one uh, question is that uh, the development, development aid you know, agencies, when they come to a country like uh, China, which is, you know, is also, uh, you know, it's a control, it's a one party, you know, system. So the development agencies tend to have, you know, too much, you know, self-censorship, you know, rich, you know, compromise with the you know local government a lot, and the office in you know, the programs actually is you know is administered you know also by the government, and the staff recruited by the government, and uh, so the those you know development aid agencies they have a very you know so I will agree that uh, if the development agency keep a political neutral, a less political approach in in local uh, countries, I think it's okay because you might be accepted by local, you know, society. But if you have too much, you know, self-censorship and you follow the, you know, uh, the political lines, you know, of, you know, like the Chinese government, that might harm the, you know, uh, pro-democratic forces. For example, the, the development aid, aid agencies, they only give, you know, grant to like government-selected, you know, organizations and they, Isolated, you know, the pro-democratic forces, you know, in the local communities. So that is uh, issues. And also, when some issues like uh, about the freedom of NGOs, uh, human rights issues, some development agencies, you know, might be utilized by local government as a soft power, you know, for, to lobby, you know, the international aid to lobby in the West. So that is something we, we need, you know, to, uh, to to think about that. So it's a uh, so, for example, when sometimes, you know, like, uh, for example, like uh, NGOs in China working on human rights were cracked down by government, and the government, you know, utilized some other NGO to show to the, you know, to the media, talk to the Western, you know, aid, you know, agencies, and, uh, you know, telling them how, you know, freedom they, they are enjoying in China. So, so that is, uh, that is my, my concern. I hope that the uh, development aid agencies should have um, a minimum you know, criteria, not to compromise too much, yeah. Thank you. Is there another one? Mike Allen. Michael Allen with the NED. I wonder if the panel could uh, address, I wonder if the panel could address the um, implications of Tom's remarks about 
the, uh, the emergence of this authoritarian development model because much of the discussion has really been within the kind of paradigm of the traditional Western approaches to development assistance. And as we know, China now is, is emerging as a major player, famously does not insist on any democratic governance or human rights conditionalities to its development. And is that likely to, well, one could say on the one hand that sh should or could uh, reinforce the democratic imperative, the agency of democratic criteria in development. On the other hand, it could strengthen the hand of, uh, of for instance, principled agnostics. Uh, so I wondered if you wanted to address the implications of that uh, development. Good, why don't we respond to those? Is, do you want to start, Brian? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds like you may get a movement of principled agnostics going. Yeah, I, I'm going to respond a little bit indirectly to some of these questions, both because they're complex and because I am a staff member of the World Bank in terms of how I frame them. I don't want to get involved in a discussion on World Bank policy. Um, so. Two, two broad points that I want to make, um, which pick up, I think, many of these. The first one is, in my view, it is a huge advance for both development work and, in the long run, for work on democratization, that the development community broadly is embracing what I call small-g governance approaches, because that that is a framing which puts at the heart of the way we do our development work an engagement with civil society organizations around achieving development results. And it puts at the heart of how we do our development work the sense that, these, that the challenge of weak effectiveness and poor performance that we might see through state-centric models of um, delivering development and delivering services cannot simply be addressed from the inside of those, but needs to be addressed through more transparency, more participation, more accountability in the way we do World Bank, education, health, roads, and a whole variety of areas. And that is a huge change from a decade ago. And so I, I, I want to underscore that because it's the, it's the way that men, many, perhaps even the majority of my World Bank colleagues will work today, is that kind of outreach to civil, the World Bank is different from a bilateral agency because of our articles and what they say about politics. But we do routinely now work in the way that I've just described. So that's the first comment. My second comment, is, my second theme, and it's somewhat tied to the broader questions on development assistance reform. <coughs> and it's the enormous dilemma that is posed of country ownership. And well, I, I like what you said earlier about that in terms of c country ownership is broader than government ownership. But there's another side to this dilemma. And it's a side to the dilemma, and speaking, of, again, as, speaking as a World Bank staffer, and maybe you, you asked about US development assistance. You know, one of the things that we have wrestled with in the last years is the challenge of, well, how do you address corruption in development projects? And I'm not speaking of corruption on the part of the staff of development agencies. The World Bank has an admirable record there, and I think it's, it's a very, very strong record, actually. Even with intensive and in-depth scrutiny, the experience of the organization in terms of corruption and staff is one of their, a very strikingly honest and professional staff. I'm speaking more about the dilemma broadly of what happens in development projects. And there is a solution to the problem of corruption in development projects. The solution to the, corruption of pro the problem of corruption in development projects is throw in more and more outsiders and more and more controls over the way in which those projects function. Ring fence them and gold plate your ring fencing so you know where every single penny is going. Okay, and that, and no, and that of course is done in a way that's outside of a realm of government. And I, I dare say that the experience of some of my colleagues, uh, to put this gently, when they're working in multi-donor consortia, is that some donors are really preoccupied with saying the way we have to do everything is completely ring-fenced in this way. But if you think about that ring-fencing, that ring-fencing is another version of no country ownership. You know, the way this emerges in our own discussions, if, if you look at the World Bank's impact on education or health in India. 
You know, the amount of money that the World Bank puts into education and health in India is trivial in relation to the amount of money that the government of India puts into education and health. I think that's true. You add up all the donor support for India. Same thing is even true in a country like Bangladesh. Our resources are really small in relation to the total resources that are spent in these sectors. So the question that arises is, how can we do our development work in a way that helps reshape not just how the one-tenth or one-half of one percent of resources going into those sectors that comes from donors are being used. How can we reshape the way we work in a way that changes how those resources pass through the system and the accountabilities for those resources in the system, for the system as a whole? And that's an ownership question, and it's an ownership question which I think is at least as fundamental as the ownership questions that were referred to earlier. And that, that I think, is the root issue we want to ask about how development assistance is provided. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, I have a comment uh, partly based on the questions and partly in response to Brian's presentation. And Brian, it's, it's really a question for you or a comment. I think that in the category of states that are one of the two that you described, the ones that have dominant power systems or a stronger state and seem to be moving down the trajectory, I think two hard questions present themselves for the development community that are, that are not yet resolved. One is where such a state really does seem to be developmental, like, say, Tunisia. It's really doing pretty well. How long do you wait before you start pushing or nudging a bit more on the political side? In a sense, do you, you, know, do you say, well, South Korea went pretty far before the U.S. really pushed in the mid-'80s for democratic change? Or, you know, how long do you go? And then the second is the problem of I would be careful with that category of dominant power politics because a lot of those such regimes or governments are not developmental. Uh, a lot of them are quite dysfunctional. They have a clique or a clan who runs things who are in power for a long time, but as you know, they're not developmental. And so what, you know, if you take a case like Egypt, you know, you can interpret it different ways, whether Egypt is a developmental state or not. But certainly the longer term picture in Egypt is quite poor development. It's a dominant power system. And there the question is, when do you, you know, when does the development community lose its patience and it sees, say, an election coming up now and say, you know what, we've kind of been through this many times. And there's a, you know, you could take your complex evolutionary view and just say, well, they'll work it out and maybe the sun will come in and he'll be a bit more reform more to that. Or you could say, no, you know what, nudging's not enough here. I'm going to reach for a bigger tool than a nudge. <laughs> You know, because this election is really a juncture that could be fundamental for Egypt's future. I think that's a really difficult question. I'm just saying these are things that strike me as, as you start breaking down your category, which I think is useful. There's very different kinds of cases in it. With respect to your question, Andrew, about the United States and USAID reform, USAID is, is different in important ways than the bilateral aid agencies in Canada and Western Europe in that, first, it got into democracy work earlier in a bigger way but to some extent in a more political and more intrinsic way. So for example, almost no other aid agency really supports political party assistance the way USAID does. That's something most bilateral aid agencies would say, wow, that's just not something a bilateral aid agency does. That's something political foundations do. Whereas USAID has had some extremely political programs through, its, through political party assistance in some countries. That fact has tended to mean that democracy and governance work at USAID has been more isolated traditionally within the agency from the rest of the activities of the agency. Most European aid agencies, if you walk in, they'll tell you right from the beginning, oh, it's all mixed in. You know, we, we have an office here called Office for Gender Development, Peace Building, Democracy, Youth Affairs, and this. You know, democracy is just one of many soft priorities we have that are part of the developmental picture. Whereas DG work at USAID has been a very determined group of people who built up democracy and governance work at USAID as, as something fairly strong but kind of somewhat apart. Now, in the last, you know, five to seven years or longer, there have been efforts at cross-cutting programs. And, and because USAID is a very decentralized organization in some ways, there have been, a, I think, some interesting experiments at the mission level. And what's important in the reform process now is to make sure those get filtered into the process and there's some learning from those. Because I think there's a new ethos at AID which says, you know, we need to figure out how to integrate better democracy and governance work with the rest of our work, which is a good ethos, and I'm all for that. But... Um, the trick is to do it without losing the strong commitment to democracy and governance and using the lessons that, that come from the field. And so I think they're, they're, they're at a different starting point than all the other bilateral aid agencies as a result of that. 
Uh, Scott, did you want to? Uh, just to, I guess a few things. There are a lot of points that were were raised, but on the on the implications for development assistance reform, I would just say that I think um, for a whole host of reasons there is um, a case to be made for a, de a degree of separateness, not in terms of kind of uh, the discussion, the learning, but in terms of the the comparative skills, the organizational flexibility to keep some organizational uh, uniqueness uh, that preserves the the, the unique uh, comparative advantage of the democracy community. I think um, there is, you know, in getting from point A to point B, as Brian said, I mean, part of the answer of how you get there is through through politics and political processes and those that come from that political background, I think, have a lot of knowledge about how those political processes occur. And so it, it, there's also the question of how you continue to support democracy in places that are middle income or are not large recipients of development aid. If we start from the, the premise that it's in kind of the US or global interest to advance both democracy and human rights and economic development, um, you know, there are uh, places where those Venn diagrams, of course, diverge, and there there is a role, I think, for the democracy community uh, in places that are no longer a focus of development assistance, and and that, and often those countries are more important because they're regional powers and have spillover effects that that uh, that are quite important. So, I guess as the discussion continues to evolve, uh, I think there's there's hope that those that that the learning and the discussion and some of the approaches can can uh, happen, but while retaining these respective comparative advantages, because I think that's important. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to be said about uh, China and the alternative development model. Um, it's hard to know kind of where to start with that one, but I guess the, the, um, uh, the, the point I would make just is I think that the, the demand for democracy, its its demise is is premature. Its reports of its demise are, are vastly premature. I mean, the, the, the in terms of the long term, I'm also extremely optimistic. This it's it's great to have these discussions, um, but uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the things that drive this are, are people on the ground and requests that we get and the fundamentals of. Uh, the work that democracy activists do, I don't think have changed that much. Um, it's a fun, people fundamentally want to have a say in how they're governed, and um, no matter you know the existence of successful development in a, an authoritarian country, at a fundamental level, uh, I think it doesn't change that. Um, uh, the the uh, experience in terms of non conditional aid in Africa. Um, so a long discussion to be had there, but um, I think sometimes there is a an overfocus on kind of that case. Um, certainly, uh, there is no shortage of, of successful development in more democratic countries. I think when you look at successful economic development in authoritarian countries, it's a question at what point in their development trajectory. You have lots of examples of catastrophic reversal, um, and and you know people might have said the same thing about Zimbabwe at one point in time, or you know there there it, there is. Um, yeah, I, I think um, in the fundamentals are are strong, and I think in the long term, I think I'm, yeah, I think I'm very optimistic. Uh, thank you. We're going to take just two more questions, then we'll uh, make sure we give Brian a chance to respond to Tom, but give each of the speakers the last word. So I'll take Ben Riley and Jerry Hyman. Please try to keep the question short, though. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm a bit disappointed with this discussion, I have to say. Um, you know, it, there seems to have been an acceptance from everyone that we are not talking about trade-offs, that somehow these two concepts are related, that we can have everything that we want, you know, that you can have motherhood and apple pie together. I just think that's fundamentally um, questionable and probably wrong. Um, Brian, you and I have already had discussions about this. I don't think democracy occurs 
along evolutionary lines. Most of the third world has democratised in big bang revolutions. Uh, and I'm not an economist, but what I understand of Schumpeter, economies don't uh, develop that way either. Um, but, but, but I think we need to move away from this, this insane Swedish idea that if we call a lack of democracy poverty, then we've made an advance. Actually, that's a huge analytical regress because it means that we can't... Uh, you know, everything's the same. We, we can't compare when democracy succeeds in poor countries because apparently they're part of the same thing. Let me give you a concrete example, and then I'll stop because I think we've also... Uh, I'm sorry to criticise all my friends who I re respect very much, but... Uh, you know, we need some more specificity in this discussion. There is a trade-off in political terms often between representation and efficiency, all right? If we want to build highly representative political systems, we are, in democratic terms, probably doing a good thing, but we are not necessarily creating highly efficient uh, governmental systems. And uh, there is a big argument to be had, for example, about whether the kinds of hyper-representational systems that have been bequeathed by the West in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in Nepal, none of which can create governments, but which are, um, you know, ethnically uh, representative, uh, there's lots of women's programs and so on, whether this really is the right way to go. I, I think we need to get into these sorts of hard questions which involve recognising that there are actual trade-offs between uh, sometimes having, you know, uh, the most efficient form of government for development and having a, an ideal democracy. And, and I, I, I would guess that one of the reasons most of the development crowds are not here is that they've already actually made that decision uh, on the... Well, well, your friend Philip Levy, for example. I mean, all... Fa uh, not Philip Levy, I'm terribly sorry, Brian. Um, uh, the party's guy. Kiefer. Philip Kiefer. Philip Kiefer. You know, all of that literature is actually about how you need to have big programmatic parties if you want development. It's not about how, how we should have highly representative systems. You know, there's, there are, we need to start thinking about trade-offs more seriously uh, intellectually if we're going to make progress on this agenda. Thank you for uh, stirring you. things up. I'm uh, Jerry Hyman at the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies and uh, something of a veteran of some of these conflicts you've been talking about. Um, so I, I guess follow up Brian's um, questions here. One is that it seems to me that, Tom, that if um, in this happy convergence, uh, there, there's two, two paradigms here. One is a happy convergence sort of between the democracy and development communities. They're getting closer together. Will it last? Is the marriage destined to end in divorce? And, and so on. Are there basic conflicts or not? Uh, and then the, the potential convergence, evolutionary convergence between, you know, sort of orangutans all the way up to you know, Neanderthals. <laughs> and, and hopefully they'll all wind up in the same place if we can only get to the Galapagos and then come back again. And, Mark. and, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about that, those, th the models there. One is that, Tom, it seems to me that, um, and I've sort of been on the development side of the democracy and and that it does require you, I think, at least programmatically, to make some potential trade-offs, which is what we were talking about, you were talking about earlier. Do you give a pass, for example, on the democracy side, and do less programming if the, if the country's government looks like it's got open small g governance or is opening small g governance? Do you say, well, look, let's wait? And if, if that's true, how long do you wait? What's the time limit? When do you feel that? The second is that uh, on the development side, w what about all these people that, that, that want to move beyond just uh, PTAs and uh, water users' participation in a, an environment in which the government holds all the cards? It's often highly uh, pat patronage based and, and so on and so forth. And so the, I guess the, the other side of that is to what extent does small g governance, even if you get it, lead you in this evolution that you, you think sort of that you're going to wind up with now a new genus or a new species? Or to what extent do you just get, you know, more waddly participation at the bottom without any serious change in, this, in the situation? And I guess you could say, well, the ultimate in high income countries, there aren't very many high income countries with good Gini coefficients that aren't also democracies. And so I guess the development people would say, well, if we can get there, 
then they'll wind up as democracies. But I, I don't know if that's true outside of East Asia. That is, mm -hmm. if, you, if you isolate the East Asian examples, do you find other cases where, you're get, where we're getting good small G governance, even good large G governance, and not democracy? I think there are quite a lot of those. And so how do you make that jump to, in this evolutionary sequence that you're talking about toward um, a high income, high complex, but democratic environment? Yeah. OK. Now we'll turn to our uh, speakers. Shall we? Well, why don't we this time we'll give Scott the first sure, chance, sure. then yeah. Brian, and then Tom to finish. But try to keep it short, please. Sure. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, I take the point. I mean, the. the um, I mean, the. Um, I guess my point is that sometimes um, those trade-offs are. Um, are over exaggerated. I think, and they're at, at the country level. I think it's clear to see them, and we can kind of negotiate through that at a country level. But I think, in the at this level of the discussion, in terms of where the two communities have moved uh, over the last several decades, I think um, there are often times. Uh, uh, more areas for win-win than have been previously acknowledged. And I think that's the point. I think as um, because of these different histories, because of these evolutions that Tom has done a good job of laying out, I think we, um, that, uh, yeah, that there is uh, lost opportunities for, uh, for, for, um, you know, doing this more in a more mutually reinforcing way that does have, uh, you know, that is a win-win. I think um, in terms of the, the trade-off issues, and this yeah, goes back uh, to the, the point about foreign assistance, I think there are a lot of those trade-offs involve kind of geopolitics. And the question is kind of recognizing that geopolitics is what it is, you know, where, you know, how do you kind of uh, walk and chew gum at the same time? And I think that's a role that the democracy community has played very um, ably over the years in terms of being able to provide useful nudges, uh, occasionally be transformational, um, at the same time that kind of the uh, geopolitics kind of are what they are. So. Okay. Uh, Brian, let me just add, I was going to pose you a question somewhat similar to Ben's, although I think I distinguish between politics and uh, economics, but my question would have been, isn't politics revolutionary more than evolutionary? That there are sharp junctures where things change in a radical way. Uh, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, so multiple responses which I think cut across these. The first one is a huge amount to be gained by being empirical. What we're asking here are not ultimately questions of shoulds, Values are in the backdrop, as I'll come back to, but we're asking questions about what the dynamics actually look like. So that's just the first point, and I'm going to speak to that in a number of ways. Second point, having said that, I think as a stylized response in relation to Tom's comment, in a middle-income setting, I would be more comfortable taking, taking the Jaworski result as my point of departure when, you're, when you said, how long does one wait? for? I'd be more comfortable saying, one can move proactively in a middle-income setting than I would be in a low-income setting with a qualifier I'll come to. So that's the second theme. I think the, the unbundling between middle-income and low-income is important for us in thinking this through. Third, um, and this is tied to that, if you ask the question, how long does one wait, I'd ask a couple of issues. The first is, what actually is the current pattern, pattern as well as rate of growth? Are we, If we're seeing highly inclusive growth at 8 to 10% per annum, which is transforming a society, which is what growth at that rate that's inclusive does, I would argue that that actually is a very potent tool that in the medium and long run is pro-democratization. Second question is an empirical question, Tom, in relation to what you posed for low-income countries. Where you what one has seen a discontinuous shift towards democracy, what do the data tell us about, number one, the probabilities of reversal? And number two, the probabilities of the, imp the impact of that on per capita income and change over time. Those are empirical questions that I think we can come to grips with. And we want to, we, I think we know the answer for middle-income countries. We want to probe it in the context of democratic transitions for low-income countries. Finally, 
I'm actually very exercised by one empirical question, which I think is fundamental. And I'm exercised by this question because one of the reasons why I frame as I do around multiple paths is to make the space in the discourse for low-income countries that there is a path of rapid, sustained, and inclusive growth that is consistent with openness. When you read the development literature, and in this sense, Tom, if we look historically at the literature and if we look at the comparative experience, the story is rather clear on, and you're exactly right, that maybe five out of every six efforts, the so-called dominant party, turn out to be fake or turn out to reverse. But the story is clear as to when it works, what that trajectory and what that dynamic looks like. But the fact is, when we actually ask the question, how do countries that have weak formal institutions and low incomes, but for whatever reason are seeking to operate with relatively open politics and open democracy, what does that trajectory look like over the next four to five decades? How does that trajectory take you from low to middle income? We're asking the questions of, of countries like, let me just put two names out there that flag them. We're asking that question for the Afghanistans. What, is, what does democracy look like in such a setting? We're also asking that question for Bangladesh. Okay, and the Bangladeshis of this world, we'll recall that Bangladesh is open, competitive, highest rates of corruption globally for a period of time, sought to fix its institutions and then gave up and said, we can't do it that way. We need to return to clientelistic openness. And the truth is, and I think this is a fundamental research question as dare I say the democratization theme has moved from middle income countries, which was much of the thrust if I go back prior to the 1990s, even a decade in the, into low income countries. Do we have a compelling, clear, empirically anchored understanding of how an open, low-income country with weak institutions becomes a middle-income country and progressively becomes more programmatic in its politics and more genuinely rule-bound and rule-of-law-bound in its operation. I, and my, my, my sense as I review the comparative experience is that at this point we don't. And I think it's a rather urgent empirical issue for those of us, and I include myself, that have a value preference for a dynamic path that flows through democracy from the low income to understand that path better, because we don't. Thank you. And last word to Tom. Yeah, well, I'll be brief. Time's out. Jerry, I'm, uh, I'm a little puzzled why you use it, you characterize what I said as a happy consensus. I said an unequal, uneasy consensus. That's not a recipe for a happy marriage. Um, so I didn't use the term happy consensus. <laughs> now, so I'm, I think you're misconstruing what I said. Now, I think by having here on the panel Brian and Scott, who represent in a certain way on both the development side and the democracy side, the sides of those community that are most leaning towards looking for some consensus, it does give a picture of a greater de degree of consensus than exists. And that, that relates to what you said, Ben. I kind of am starting from the assumption that the both communities are deeply concerned about trade-offs and have started. The reason they were so separated is they really didn't have much common ground and really the development community believed democracy was an enormous trade-off against development, basically in their gut, and have had to get closer and closer over the year to accepting that maybe some parts of it may be small G but not big G and what are the paths, you know, are struggling with this idea of how is it developmental. But I'm, I guess I'm assuming that was, in a certain sense, the whole basis was very different perspectives. Uh, and so I think what you're seeing here today is maybe it's a little bit happy, Jerry, because these are nice guys and they represent <laughs> the progressive side of each community. But like I say, it's an uneasy and unequal, and I'm not even sure, convergence. Um, There's, as I said, is very unclear where it's going. So I, I, I don't think we're trying to present here the idea that there's, there's this happy common ground in the middle, because I think this is very much up for grabs. And I think... You know, developmentalists like Brian are asking very hard, sort of empirically based questions. And I think the democracy community is feeling like there's a lot of things they need to do in a world in which democracy is very shaky. And we're not really sure this is as much a common agenda as it may appear. I purposely wrote this article, I think, Ben, rather than trying to just keep setting off hand grenades or dynamite throughout the article <laughs> saying, look at all these trade offs and all this conflict. I was trying to say, let's talk. You know, and so maybe that's smoothing over these things more than it should. But I, I think there's.
uh, that alone, you know, needs to be done. And, and Let's Talk still needs to be done widely within the development community uh, about democracy issues, despite 20 years of there being this other democracy community out there. So I take the spirit of what you say. Maybe I've just approached it in, in a slightly different way. Uh, thank you all, and thank you to the audience for coming. Thank you.